and we are now recording. Okay, so when it comes to test taking strategy and taking exams, the most important thing that you do is, is time management. So with Dr. Sarkar's exams, you're going to have 50 questions. Is it 50 questions for 50 minutes, Kristen? Is that still? Yes, it is. Okay. So time management is a huge component of, of taking the exam. So you get 60 seconds per question. So what this means is that with every single question, I should say there's going to be questions that are going to take longer than 60 seconds and hopefully questions that take less than 60 seconds. You're going to look for a couple different styles of questions. You can have very straightforward questions, which is like literally asking which of the following is the oxidizing agent. That should be a very straightforward question. What makes this question difficult is if you don't know your vocab and you don't know what an oxidizing agent is. So this is where all of like the YouTube videos that I've put out, the tutoring sessions, his lectures, the things that he focused, I would personally would say his lectures are great for like starting, like in, get, his recorded lectures are good for getting an idea of the material and getting like extra information for like the slides. But really his book supplemented with my the YouTube videos that I've made is really, really good for like terminology and more of the specifics of like, this is what's going to be on the test. You absolutely need to know these things. What I would do between now and the test is every single day, or even if you can, the next two, three days, crush through a lot of either my videos or his lectures, whichever you feel T helps you learn better and look for all of those keywords either specific vocab words that I say, like, hey, you need to know this, or if his stuff, whatever he um, hits on the most during his lectures, those are the kind of things that are going to be on the test. And literally a good chunk of this stuff is just understanding vocab and being able to understand the question. Like this question, this should be a super straightforward question, as long as you know what oxidizing agent means. OK, you're going to have then the paragraph questions. This is the questions that are literally. Like three to five sentences. With a bunch, I can't spell. This is why I'm a science major, I can't spell. Three to five sentences with a bunch of sciency mumbo jumbo. That makes your brain hurt. And you end up reading it like seven times because you can't figure out what the crap he is asking you. Does that sound about accurate, Kristen? For those who have taken is we're taking this class before. Yes, it does sound familiar, and it is a pain in the butt. Okay, the trick to these questions is literally understanding 90% of all the words you do not need to even see. Okay? 90% of the time, what you are looking for or what the teacher is asking is in the last sentence or the first sentence. OK. So in a timed exam like this. The very first thing that I do, if I see a paragraph, I read the first sentence. And then I skip everything else and I read the last sentence. Or sometimes I'll skip the whole thing and just read the last sentence first. So read the last sentence first. What this is going to do 
is tell you what you what information is actually important. Um, because it tells you what you are trying to answer. Okay. So if I read the very last sentence and the last part of the sentence says, for example, um, I don't think you guys have gotten to this, but you'll get it later in enzymes. Have you guys gotten into um, exergonic versus endergonic? Have you gotten into any of that yet? Yes. Okay. So, for example, the very last sentence could be, is this reaction endergonic or exer exergonic? And it's three paragraphs of you titrate this and this together with this and this and this and this happens and whatever, blah, 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 blah. When in all reality, you just need to know, oh, it's a titration. What's a titration? It's a weak acid and it's conjugate base. What does that mean? <clears throat> that means when you put the weak acid in, the weak acid is going to lightly break down. That's an exergonic type reaction. And that's it. That he's gonna he's gonna give you a ton of fluff and a ton of extra information. He's gonna give you numbers and all this extra stuff in the middle that literally don't you don't give a crap about at all. So strategy with the paragraph type questions. Skip to the last sentence, read the last sentence, figure out what it is you're supposed to be answering. And then if you need to jump back and read the whole question, you can do that, but that will save you a lot of headache of having to read through the entire question. And you're reading through the whole question slowly because you don't want to miss any information. And then you get to the end and it asks you something specific or something that's happening. And then you have to go back and reread the whole question. That's going to take you three times as long than just reading the last sentence and then coming back to the question. Okay. And this is a good strategy for all of your all of your classes when you get into um, a lot of classes, especially like um, systems pathology and try for um, what's it called gen path in try three, I believe it is. Um, physiology and uh, physiology one and two and tries two and three, a lot of those classes are going to be very similar. And they'll give you like long winded questions when in reality, like they're just looking for one specific thing. OK, those are the main two kind of questions that you're going to get. I lump under the straightforward questions, the not. Sorry, wait one sec. You going to bed, bud? Come here. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Love you. Hey, you want to go next? Thank you. Hey. Good night. Mwah. Eh. Okay, I'm back. Um, so lumping into that same category, which of the following? is not the heck there we go um he'll also get you with all of the following are a bunch of stuff here like all of the following are nonpolar would um are nonpolar aromatic amino acids except for what except for which and a lot of people will stop lit reading after all of the following are whatever and go and answer the question um and they miss this word here and then they answer the question wrong so these kind of questions these three uh, be happening to me because yep um because he does as a lot of those questions on his lit literature um, and then 
when I get when it comes back the second I mean when you get your answers you be like oh okay I answered that wrong it's supposed to be the other one because I didn't read it all the way through yeah um super super important if the question is shorter read it all the way through and scan and look for those keywords always be on the lookout for the not for the except those ones are also like um chris and i think i heard that he took a lot of these questions out but sometimes he'd have answer choices where answer choices were like all but two of the above does he still do those questions or no i'd heard he'd stopped doing that but i'm not sure he hasn't been asking okay. those type of questions i haven't been seeing those really okay. it's just the first two mainly i'm sorry okay. you're good uh, I'm pretty sure he had some of those questions last trimester, and I remember them quite frequently because I use my down finger on the arrow, and that's what bit me in the butt on those questions. Okay. Yeah, so these, sometimes he'll have questions like this, or like um, all but two of the above, or, or he'll have like all all but one of the above. Um, And it's like, so there's like three three to five answer choices. Um, and he'll be like, instead of all of the above, it's all but one of the above. And so two of the three are, are correct answers. And so um, best strategy for all questions. <clears throat> kind of, I'll give you kind of a checklist. Number one, uh, identify the type of question he is asking. Is it a straightforward question or is it a paragraph type of question? Look for the keywords, the not, except, um, all, etc. to determine what exactly it is that you're looking at. Um, and if it's a paragraph, Read the last sentence first. After that, look at the answer choices. Look at all the choices, especially the last one or two. The last one or two is where he'll throw these, throw those all but one of the above or those kind of things he'll throw that at the last two a lot of people will see like the first correct answer choice like oh yeah i like that one click it and move on but you need to make sure you read all the way through where because he'll have questions that are like uh two of the above are correct or all of the above are correct or one uh, all but one are correct he'll throw in a couple of those so you need to make sure you read through all of the answer choices as well for most of the straightforward questions, I'd say, again, like at least more than half the time, two of the answer choices should pretty obviously be wrong, and then you're kind of down to a 50-50. A lot of times that's the way it is. It's just kind of remembering your vocabulary, remembering the key words that, you, that we go through um, in the different PowerPoints, the different videos, and the different in the tutoring sessions any of those like heavy vocab words that I've mentioned, like this is going to be on the test, that kind of stuff is making sure that you remember and know and understand what those are and what they mean. It's like the oxidizing agent. <clears throat> what is an oxidizing agent? Uh, I always get these confused. I'm pretty sure it's the thing. The oxidizing agent is the thing that's going to be reduced. So if it's going to, if it's getting reduced, then it's like, okay, what does that look like before it actually gets reduced? It's just like an NAD. NAD is going to accept the hydrogen. It's not yet in its reduced form or whatever it is that we said last week when we talked about those. I hated these questions. I talk a lot about these questions because I absolutely hated these because they made my brain hurt a lot. 
Tanisha, does that does that help a little bit kind of in the approach for answering yes. his questions? Yes, because yeah, to to break it down to that's that's how he when the quizzes comes, you know all of them, but then uh, when the test comes, it's like so much going on and I'll be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so yes. yeah, his his exams, I sincerely felt this way as well. His exams were definitely a step up from his um were qu- a pretty big step up from the quizzes so <laughs> that's how i felt um but yeah oh uh, and i th- that last question that i mean that well you was um was saying the straightforward i'm sorry that's my baby no you're um, good she, I think he did ask one question like that, um, where I forgot what it was, but it was all the above. I don't know how he asked it, but he didn't ask it like that. He asked it in a different way. Yeah. Kind of confused me. Um, yeah. A little bit. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you, you're good. I got a, I got a one year old, so I, I get it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's gonna be, and. A big part of this program, y'all, is is going to be relearning how to take tests because you're you're I mean, y'all saw your your schedule for exams. Let me I had it up here a second ago, like y'all's schedule of February 5th, 5th, 7th, 13, 14, 15. Like this is this is kind of the way it's going to be. And it's it's gonna come quick, and it's gonna go like it's gonna hit hard. Um, and the the best thing I can say right now is get all of your get everything kind of in order, so like that you're starting to review right now for this biochem one exam. Y'all that are here, the best thing you can do because start reviewing now going back over videos one do something every single day to prep for this exam same thing with this foc exam like start now and then as soon as you're done with these two start prepping as well do something every single day to prep for the daa exam and every single day for the fdi exam um, a lot like the lab practical and the exam for daa a lot of those will go hand in hand but yeah it's just it starts going you just need to make sure you stay on top of things and continue like go through step by step um every single day doing something to prep for that exam okay uh go away okay um let's actually do this christine you sent me this let me see if i can pull it up i found it right now what do what is what topics does everybody kind of feel? What do people feel like they're maybe the weakest in versus the versus stronger in? We have uh, enzymes, proteins, amino acids. Enzymes and right now, I know. For me, feel like okay. you're str- you're struggling more with enzymes. We literally just started them this week, so it's like I know they're on the exam this upcoming. I feel a little more confident with aminos and proteins now so okay how does everybody else feel do do we want to go over enzyme stuff sounds good to me nice sweet let's see if this loads (laughs) you're welcome (laughs) yeah our we can all see how i did because i didn't even take it i just literally submitted it and said so (laughs) <laughs> okay, did you Okay, so the first two are correct and the rest aren't. Okay. I just got yeah. it'll tell you the right Well, I wanted to get them to you so you had them. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. It's it's honestly it's better if they're incorrect that way we can hide the correct answer and Well, the problem um... is you can't cuz it puts a check mark by what's correct. Yeah, but only two of them are correct. So the first two are correct and all the rest are wrong. So Yeah. <laughs> um okay. <clears throat> This will be good practice with, like, with questions. So right here, boom, massive question. So what's the very first thing that we got to do? Not read the first uh, sentence. Read the last one. Screw all that crap. 
what type of inhibition is being displayed? Okay, so we know we're looking at inhibition. Okay, we immediately think, and we can even look right at our answers. Uh, Non-competitive, allosteric, irreversible, competitive. Do we know what all of these words mean? Can I edit this? Let me see if I can. Let me uh, set this up so that I can actually write on this. Hey, Drake, is it worth it to get the um, Adobe package so you can actually write on your stuff? I don't use Adobe at all because I hate paying for stuff. Okay. Like, like literally, I I would rather watch a million ads than pay two ninety nine for anything. So, what uh, do you use for writing on stuff for PDFs? I literally just use Microsoft Edge. Okay. I use Notability on my iPad, but I mean, you have to have an iPad, I guess. So. So, how does that work with Microsoft Edge? You can just. I'll I'll show you and I'll show you in one sec, as right. soon as this finishes, and now I can I can pull it up. If you guys want a good laugh, look at how long it took me to do that test <laughs> for two questions. Forty forty one days and one hour. <laughs> I started it way back when we went through that chapter, and I never finished it the first time. <laughs> yes, I have been through this class before. For those who didn't know. <laughs> Why won't you open? There it goes. Okay, so when you open something with Microsoft Edge, um, a, a PDF with Microsoft Edge, oh, come on. Let me see if I can get this to... You could always save it as a new PDF. That's what I did. Doesn't want to open though. Let me re-download and see if it'll. Someone just asked if they could be added to the meeting. Yeah, just click on it. So just you just gotta you gotta click click the link. Somebody tell him. I just told him to click the link above. I have a question. What's that? Um, is this one going to be recorded at the other ones? Like we put them in YouTube so I could um, pause and then go back or. Yep, every, every, it's, it's going to be the same. Every single video will be Tuesday, eight o'clock will be recorded and we posted YouTube. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Here we go. So see, this is now you can see. So with Microsoft Edge. Um, okay. When you get a PDF, it'll automatically pop up with these things up above where the oh. highlighter, draw, erase, and the text. Jeez. So I okay. can literally come in here and I can just type anything or I can highlight. This is what I used like, on all my videos. Like it hi highlights. This is how I did all of that recording was on Microsoft Edge. I can draw. And if you have an iPad, um, not an iPad, if you have like any kind of tablet or if you have um, a laptop with a pencil, you can use Microsoft Edge and do the same thing with with the pencil. Genius. Did not know that. Thank cool. you, Rick. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Question one. So what type of inhibition is being displayed? So we're looking at inhibition. A 10-year-old boy presents with vomiting, sweating, drooling, and decreased heart rate. His friends say they're using a cornfield and sprayed with a red crop duster. The chemical being sprayed was an organophosphate derivative that covalently bonds to acetylcholinesterase and then activates the enzyme completely. So it inactivates the enzyme completely. So we look at this question that we're looking at. What type of inhibition? So we look at our an answer choices, okay? And if I remember correctly, he actually has a slide super specifically in his PowerPoints. Um, yes, he does. 
about organophosphates, Biochem 1, lectures, enzymes. Do, 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 do. I think it's at the very organo. I think he has it in here somewhere. He does. I remember it. It's in one of these. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in here somewhere. This, there's a lot of slides in this specific lecture. But in here somewhere, there's something about organophosphates. I know for a fact that there is. But Or it's in the book, one of the two. Um, so when we talk about non-competitive, so let's look at definition-wise. So a non-competitive enzyme reaction, does anybody know what that means or can tell me in their own words, what that means. No competition from the binding site on that particular item. So we look at it. Non-competitive inhibition, a type of allosteric regulation, is a specific type of enzyme inhibition characterized by an inhibitor binding to an allosteric site, resulting in decreased efficiency of efficacy of the enzyme. So if we look at this, if we know the definition of this, right? If you know the definition of non-competitive, non-competitive versus competitive, a non-competitive is literally allosteric regulation. So we look at this, like allosteric regulation and non-competitive are essentially saying the same thing. So allosteric regulation where something binds to somewhere besides the active site and prevent and decreases this is decreases efficacy efficacy of the enzyme what do, what do y'all understand about how like enzyme inhibition so if i say like get non-competitive or like an allosteric inhibition right how how does the inhibition happen when in, when we talk about an allosteric inhibition? I'll draw it out. I'll show you guys. So allosteric. So we have right here a protein, right? And our protein has a binding site. This binding site is specific to some kind of protein that's going to fit perfectly right into that space in order to cause this protein to, to do something that it's supposed to do. Allosteric, and allosteric means that somewhere besides the this binding site, there's going to be another spot. It's like right here. There's a little spot. Let me do this. I'll draw it like this. We have our. There's another spot here that something else can come and bind to. And when it binds there, if we stop and we think back how when we were forming proteins, right? When the different amino acids and everything bound together and formed an amino acid chain, after it formed that chain, what caused it to take its shape? What was occurring, what occurred for it to then take a new shape to go to a secondary and then a tertiary form? Um, the sats and their electronegativity or their their charge, how it how it wrapped. We had their charge. We had those things. We started to form hydrogen bonds. All of the properties of the different amino acids interacted with each other to create a shape. 
So let's say that this guy right here is very negatively charged. If this whole thing has formed a shape based on all of the properties of all of the amino acids, right? And I all of a sudden introduce a big old fat negative right into it. What's going to happen to its shape? Is the shape going to stay the same? Is it going to change or is it the entire enzyme just going to explode? It's going to change the shape of the enzyme. Exactly. So we're introducing something new that changes the shape of the enzyme. So an allosteric inhibitor means that somewhere besides the specific active site, so this is called the active site right here. This is called the active site where the reactant binds to the enzyme. This extra, this inhibitor, it binds to another part of the enzyme and literally causes the shape of the enzyme to change. So like this whole portion is going to change and now it's a different shape. And because it's a different shape, our reactant can no longer fit in the active site. That's literally what is happening when we talk about allosteric inhibition. Okay. Allosteric inhibition is non competitive. So if we look up, so we look, look at the non competitive. So it's a type of allosteric regulation. So there are other types of allosteric regulation. Um, <clears throat> where it binds to a separate site and decreases the efficiency of the enzyme. So what this means, so an allosteric binding does not fully stop the enzyme working as it can be removed, but slows the enzyme down. That's what allosteric inhibition does, okay? Specifically organophosphates, I promise you, I promise you something exactly like this, talking about organophosphates, is going to be on the exam. If not this one, a future one. And if not in Biochem 1, I guarantee you that you'll get asked this question as well, either in Phys 2, GenPath, or in Systems Pathology. This will not go away. I promise you. I've been through the whole program. I've tutored 80% of the classes. I know what questions get asked this will be brought up over and over and over again, okay? Especially in Phys and Systems Path um, and other classes. Okay, <clears throat> so it inactivates the enzyme completely, and that's where we get, and we already know the answer to this one, it is irreversible because it's going to inactivate the enzyme completely. And we also just need to know for a fact our organophosphates, like, um, pesticides this is why pesticides and stuff are super super dangerous if you get them on you is because they bind completely will not let go and that's why you can die from like inhaling or ingesting pesticides okay so this is just something lock in your brain right now this kind of question will be asked you need to know that so we saw non-competitive what do we think about what we what, what kind what do we think about competitive if non-competitive means that it's allosteric and it's binding somewhere else, what do we think about competitive? What could, what would competitive mean? It's going to bind to the active site. Exactly. With the enzyme. Exactly. So if we erase all of this, all this stuff, we have two things. We have our reactant. That's slowly changing shape. A reactant that wants to bind and is supposed to bind. And then we have something else that fits here as well and blocks our main reactant that we want from binding. So that is a competitive, it means it's going to bind to this active site and it's going to compete with the reactant for the active site. And some of those can be irreversible 
meaning that they bind. And once they're bound, they're completely stuck there. The only way that the body can kind of get rid of that is that ha- the body has to come in and completely break down and destroy the entire enzyme and build it back up from scratch. Okay. A little cool fact. This is how cyanide works. Cyanide and mustard gas, both of those. This is how they work. They are irreversible competitive binders. Um, and they prevent energy production from occurring and they and they kill you that way. So fun fact. That will eventually come up in the it's future. Also, as well. It's also why it's so dangerous to be a crop duster because you're pretty much guaranteed to die in some sort of way from that. So that's exactly. why they get paid so much. Yep, because the wind changes direction and you take a big breath of all that in. And if you're not within the hospital within 20, 30 minutes, done. You did. There's nothing you can do. Yep. All right, so organophosphates, bad. Pesticide, bad. Cyanide, bad. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. So a biochemical reaction is indicated as X plus Y equals B plus C. Delta G not of the reaction. The little zero means not. Delta, who can tell me what delta means? The little shape. Isn't it like change? Exactly. Equals delta, which equals change. <clears throat> not the little zero. Typically, it equals like the original. You'll have like delta G not, delta G1, delta G2. If there's like multiple steps in a reaction, delta the, the not to the zero indicates that it's like the original part of the of the reaction. Okay. Like I'm back in physics again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, so the biochemical reaction is indicated X plus Y equals B plus C, delta G not of the reactions in which products B and C are produced is negative 50 kilojoules per mole. Under standard conditions, the reaction blank. So biggest thing that you need to know about delta G negative equals spontaneous positive equals no go. If we have a negative delta G and the more negative that delta G is, the more likely that reaction is to just occur and just to happen without any help or any outside assistance. So, for example, if the delta G, if I say that the delta G equals 36 kilojoules per mole, is that reaction going to happen spontaneously or no? No, will not occur. Yeah, not spontaneous. If I have it negative three kilojoules, I'll give you a better one. Negative 60 kilojoules per mole. It will go. Yes, spontaneous. Negative 30 kilojoules per mole. Yes. Yes. Is it more spontaneous or less spontaneous than the negative 60? Less. Exactly. The more negative the number is, the more likely it is to be spontaneous. Okay. Same thing. If I, and if, and he, he will not give you something that's like on the fence. Okay. He's not going to give you like, oh, it's negative 0.5. No, he's, he's going to give you, like negative 15, negative, I think the lowest ones he goes, like he'll give you like negative 14-ish around there. But like, just go with, if it's negative, it's spontaneous. If it's positive, it's not spontaneous. Okay? Another way that we can look at this, a spontaneous reaction almost always is going to be exergonic, okay? Another way to say exergonic 
is exothermic. So exo, like an exoskeleton, means outside. Thermic, thermal, heat, exothermic, heat going out. So our spontaneous reactions will create or release heat. So our stuff like explosions, combustion, like in our car, that kind of stuff, all of those reactions are considered our more spontaneous reactions. Okay? Because it's, re it's releasing heat. In order to release any kind of heat, so to release heat, we break bonds. Okay? And what's cool about all of this stuff is we really only have to memorize one side because on the other side, our non-spontaneous reactions, who knows what those are called? Endergonic. Our endergonic, endothermic. Are these going to release heat or take heat in? In. Take it in, sorry. Takes heat in. So is this going to be breaking bonds or creating bonds? Creating. Good. So we have our positive delta G equals this. Our negative delta G equals this. He can ask this kind of question in any way. So he could say right here, he could give you this whole thing, this whole question. And then he, a different question that he could ask you is, is this reaction ender or exergonic? And what's the answer to that question? Exo. Exo or exergonic. Exactly. Yeah. So you can see that's how he's going to kind of ask these sort of questions. And you can ask different questions even with the same exact kind of material. So understand this connection. Again, if you know one side of it, if you know negative delta G is spontaneous, exergonic releases heat and breaks bonds all of those then you know that anything that's opposite if it's positive delta g it's complete it's just the opposite <clears throat> so the whole the whole point the whole reason we have enzymes is to take these positive delta g reactions those reactions that aren't easy to have happen and we use enzymes to lower the amount of energy that we need in order for these non-spontaneous reactions to occur or to happen. Okay, that's the point of an enzyme. Next question. Okay. <clears throat> A metabolic pathway proceeds according to the scheme R goes to S, S goes to T, T goes to U, U goes to V, U go, U, V goes to W. A regulatory enzyme X catalyzes the first reaction in the pathway. Which of the following is most likely correct for this pathway? Okay, so we have a bunch of words here that we're going to need to go over and make sure that we know the definition of. So the first product, S, is probably the primary negative modulator of X, leading to feedback inhibition. So these answers are feedback inhibition, feedback inhibition, positive modulator, negative modulator, these kind of words. Negative modulator, feedback inhibition, positive modulator. We need to understand what these words mean. So outside of context of this question, if we hear negative modulator what ideas can we think what would that might when that might that look like 
And if you need to just Google it and then answer it that way, again, that's completely acceptable as long as you give the answer in your own words. I guess a more simple question to modulate something. What does that mean? So Would like it be a to negative, control how fast? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, Just like negative modulator, kind of like it's feeding off of like the negative feedback of the system it's in. Yeah, good. Let's try and break down a little bit more and think of like modulation. Less. Go ahead, Shell. Less efficient. Okay. Christine, were you going to say something? I was going to say with a negative modulation potentially moving the circuit backwards instead of forward. Like a control dial would be modulating either forward or backward. Yeah, yeah. So mod modulate literally means to um, exert a modifying or controlling influence on, so to change. To change the way something is moving or something is acting, the way something is doing. To regulate. That's another good word. Regulate. So a lot of times in chemistry, positive means like ma moving it forward, making it go like increase in its regulation. Negative decreases how much is occurring. So a negative modulator prevents the reaction um, from continuing. Okay. Slows it down. A positive modulator is exactly the opposite. Speeds up the reaction. Pushes it forward. Okay. So instead of what this question is asking, the first product S is probably the primary thing that slows down the, the that slows down the enzyme X, which leads to feedback inhibition. Feedback inhibition is a reaction that like, so we have a goal of making an end product. It's kind of like the end product of a factory line. So if, if we need, let's say if we need more, more car parts, right? The beginning of the factory assembly line is going to start and start pumping out car parts. It's going to pump them out, pump them out, pump them out, pump, pump them out until we get enough product that we need at the end. And then a worker is going to stop and yell back like, hey, we have enough car parts. Stop the assembly line. That's the way that a lot of these enzymes, a lot of these reactions work. So it, what this is saying is we this first answer, the first product S, once we form S, it goes back right here and says, OK, we're done. Stop making more. realistically like that's usually not super likely because we still have to make all of this actually hold up i missed a keyword regulatory enzyme and that is right here x So as you say, in a lot of cases, further on down the line, um, the products will give negative feedback, negative modulator feedback inhibition. A lot of times this is just called negative feedback loop or negative feedback inhibition. Um, Oftentimes, it'll typically be after a couple reactions that this occurs. But whenever you see the word regulatory enzyme, you know that that is where all of the control is going to be. Sorry if I'm not a super clear today. I had a very long day. So if it's hopefully hopefully what I'm saying is is making a little bit of sense. So what what's the <laughs> what's the answer so I can. 
my brain around it because I'm still lost. I'm pretty sure A should be the answer. Okay. Because the regulatory enzyme. I, I would I would say A is the answer. Um, you'd have to go and actually like do these questions to confirm. And I don't know if if Kristen, if you want to to do that and let us know and give it back and I can kind of go back and check our work. But I would say um, A would be, could be a really good answer where it's going to, as soon as we start forming this product, it's going to tell this to stop. Um, this isn't a fantastic question. I don't like this question because B also could be an answer. I don't either. Um, but I would, I would probably say A just based off of like what, it, because it's the regulatory regulatory enzyme. And apparently you haven't looked below yet. I guess it's the answers. Yep. B is the answer. B is the correct answer. Oh. As you can see. Carol, I'll send you a copy of this so you can look at it on yeah. your own. You have yeah. the quizzes. You bought the book. Yeah, honestly, I'll, if these are the way these questions are, I would say like. These are solid like these. Because this kind of question where it has like enough, a decent chunk of words, these these are probably really, really good testing this and like understanding if you understand why the answer is the correct answer um, and like the, in, the ins and outs of it, I think it'll really, really help you guys prep for the test. OK, this so now knowing the answer, um, are you saying that W is most likely because it, it stops? The process yeah so when we finally form get to our final product our final product is going to come back and once w is out and released it's going to come back and say hey we have formed there's enough of us you can go ahead and stop and it'll shut off the regulatory enzyme and it'll stop continuing to produce more of the final product yeah hey drake can i share something with that um, yeah, had a had my had a one on one with Dr. Sarkar today. I have him every usually two days a week. Um, and we were talking about the pathway and like technically it goes to another question we're getting ready to do to. But like if you think about it, say there's a hundred. He used the army as kind of a example, and it was able to say, hey, if there's a hundred sites and a hundred substrates, they're gonna bond one to one without a problem. The problem lies when there's a thousand other substrates outside of the other one, which one's going to get where faster. So what does it do? Makes more substrate to catch up to the army. If that makes sense. For the binding sites. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you know what I meant, Drake. Yeah. Like the, the I, I know what you meant, yeah. The the more ways, like I said, figure out what works, what like whatever. If that helps somebody understand this, perfect. If not, well, you know. Ignore it. Exactly. Why won't let me do this? Yeah, needless to say, I had to jump out of my one-on-one -on -one with him because I had to go to my meeting with Dr. Newell at uh, 2 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's move. We're going to move to the next second. And this next question, and I'm going to go ahead and pop up here. To make it a little more realistic, uh, I'm going to put a one minute timer on. So we, and we're going to see if we can explain, get through the whole question, understanding it in one minute. OK. Start. So a small molecule that decreases the activity of an enzyme by binding to a site other than the catalytic site is termed a blank. Competitive, alternative, stereospecific, or allosteric. What does everybody think? Allosteric. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's going to be the answer. Allosteric inhibitor. Let's do it like this. We're going to start going through the questions a little bit quicker. If you don't understand why the answer is the answer, speak up. I promise you, if you do not understand, if one of you does not understand why the answer is the answer, somebody else does not understand why it's the answer and is just not going to speak up. Okay. Does everybody feel okay with this or do we want to go over it? I should say, if you feel like you would like to go over it, 
up at the top, you should be able to click a little raise your hand button or just unmute and say, please go over it. Five, four, three, two, one, move it on. An enzymatic reaction increases the activation energy of a chemical reaction, decreases the rate of a chemical reaction, decreases the activation energy of the chemical reaction, or none of the above. What do we think the answer is? Is it C? It is C, Trinisha. Could you explain why you believe C is the correct answer? I don't know. <laughs> here's here's where it's important. Trinisha, if if you don't if you can't explain why it's the correct answer, yeah, that that's what's important because if you get thrown a question similar to this, but a little bit deeper in knowledge, you won't be able to answer it. So this is super super key. Let's see if we can figure out. Is anybody else? Can anybody else explain or go through why C is the correct answer? Well, enzymes are. That's what enzymes do. They decrease the activation energy of a system, and so. Uh, it just makes sense to me, I guess, that it is decreased because that's what enzymes do. I'll show you guys a chart. So this is what the chart looks like, right? So in order for a reaction to occur, Trinisha, I'm going to speak directly to you. In order for a reaction, we have reactants, so the things that are reacting to form products. In order for them to form together, right, we have to create new bonds. Bringing stuff together creates new bonds. Creating new bonds requires energy. Okay. So if we don't have an enzyme, we need this gap, but here, this red line from its base state, which is the flat line right here, up to the very top. That's how much extra energy we need to put in to this, those two reactants in order to get them to form new bonds and create the product that we want. So an enzyme, what it is, and that's the active activation energy without an enzyme. What an enzyme does is the enzyme kind of grabs onto these things and holds them in a good position and brings them kind of close enough to make it so that we don't need as much energy for them to create those bonds. So it decreases the activation energy needed to go from reactants to the product. It decreases the amount of energy that we need to get them to form those bonds. Does that make a little bit more sense? Yes, it does for me. You explained it better than Dr. Sarkar did today in our one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> Sweet. Same thing. We can actually even go the other way. We go over reactants, products. See how we look here. Um, <clears throat> these different reactions, we have exothermic and endothermic or exergonic and endergonic, right? The way these charts are, our starting energy, if our starting energy is higher than our ending energy, right? All of this energy in between had to go somewhere. The laws of thermodynamics, right? Laws of thermodynamics. This is a part in the book. The very first law is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It just changes forms. For example, chemical energy oftentimes can be converted into um, light or heat. So we think of like lighting a, a piece of wood on fire or lighting a match, right? When we light a match, the wood and everything that's part of the match starts to burn. So the wood itself is holding on to and storing. Because it's it what wood is is a bunch of everything is a bunch of chemicals stuff chemicals and a bunch of atoms and stuff stuck together and molecules bound together with bonds. And when you strike the match and it starts on fire, that chemical energy, all of those bonds, start to break, 
and you get fire, which releases heat, releases light. So the chemical energy stored inside of a piece of wood gets changed into light and heat um, energy instead. And that is exactly what is happening with an exothermic reaction. You get a release of energy in, in different forms. So like a match is an exer exergonic reaction. Something um, endothermic, for example, would be um, like an ice cube melting, right? If you hold an, an ice cube in your hand, your hand feels incredibly cold because what's actually yeah. happening is <clears throat> the ice has formed as it's frozen, it's formed specific bonds. And then it's literally sucking the heat out of your hand and going into the ice cube. So it's an exergonic reaction. Good. Wait, do you mean endo, endogonic? Yeah, ender, yeah, ender, endergonic, endothermic, endergonic, yeah. If I said extra, I apologize. Next question. An enzyme catalyzes the formation of glyceraldehyde three phosphate from dihydroxyacetone phosphate. You'll learn you'll see these names later on when we talk about like glycolysis, glycolysis. and stuff. So this this is another great example. Sometimes when you see these kind of questions, you're literally just like. WTF, like, I don't know all of this crap. Don't don't worry too much about that, OK? Half most of the time, like what the actual chemical names are and stuff doesn't really matter. Okay, it says what class of enzyme is used to catalyze this reaction? So in his book, and if you've watched my videos, he, they give examples of every single of all the different types of enzymes and what they do. So like hydrolases break stuff down um, by using water transferase transfers functional groups um ligase is going to be binding stuff together and isomerase rearranges stuff it creates an isomer of it um, if i remember correctly he should have this exact example in his in his book with the enzymes or he has it in the slides as well so this one is an isomerase this is why it's super important to kind of go through his slides, go through the book, because it'll give you like the prime examples. It'll give you the exact examples that he's going to use on his exams. And again, a lot of it isn't just raw memorization. If you can remember kind of what these enzymes do, because if we look at this glyceraldehyde three phosphate to the phosphate, if the if the phosphate disappeared, we'd think more transferase because it transfers the phosphate. A ligase, if something new was created, like we got more bonds. So let's say we went to like from glyceraldehyde three phosphate to one six bis phosphate. I'd think more of a transferase because we're adding another phosphate. You're taking me down the glycolysis path. Thanks, Drake. Yep. That we'll we'll get there one day. Oh, I finally mastered it last try. <laughs> nice. So you nice. said the isomerize. Go over this one more time. What, what? go over and this I, one more time? These so these are different types of enzymes. All of these are in the book. And it's important. Take a second. So literally isomerase enzyme define definition so it's a type of enzyme involving a structural rearrangement of a molecule so it rearranges it doesn't add anything it doesn't take anything away it just rearranges it if you remember an isomer is has the same chemical makeup but it's everything is bound together differently so this example of an isomerase. It, the rest of these, make sure you go look them up. 
what they are. Um, if you watch through my videos, I'm pretty sure I explain and give a definition for almost every single one of these. Or either that or I do most of them and then I'm like, okay, go do the rest on your own. Understanding definite, like I said, a lot of biochemistry is just straight knowing the definitions. Okay. <clears throat> Let me do this. Okay. So an enzyme that catalyzes the intramolecular movement of a functional group from one carbon atom to another would be called a blank. Okay, so Mary's. One sec. Didn't you say the transfer ice transfers? Yeah, this has isomerase on it. I feel like that's incorrect. Yeah, because it's transferring from one carbon atom to another. So it yeah. makes me think transferase. Too. I'm I'm fairly certain that the answer is incorrect on here. This that should this this should be a transferase. Because an isomerase, remember isomerase is rearranging. Oh look at that, Dr. Sarkar got something wrong. Hold up. Actually, it might be. Let me see. Let me see. This might be a technicality that we get this because a transferase. OK, this is why the answer is isomerase. But this is the answer. This is where like the individual definition of so transferase. Transfers. Functional groups from one molecule to another molecule. It, this is the correct answer is in fact isomerase because it's intramolecular. So no other so molecule is involved. Makes sense. Makes sense. So this is where the, the trickiness kind of can come in to some of these questions where it's super important to understand. Th these questions are great for practicing, honestly. Because I, I would have, first glance, I immediately would have gotten that one wrong. I would have clicked transferase and I would have moved on and I would have gotten that one wrong. Keywords. <laughs> Makes Keywords. all the difference. So, so, so now, now you know what to look for on the exam if you see this. Because you'll probably see a question similar to this. Right there, you know why. Okay. Whoa. All right. An oxidoreductase class of enzyme can be used for the conversion of. Don't want to see the answer. Okay, so keyword here we have oxidoreductase. What kind of reaction is an oxidoreductase? An oxidation. Reduction reaction. And this is where, honestly, this is going to be one of those things where he says it 8 million times. Immediately, though, my, my strategy for this in Biochem 1, y'all don't really talk about ketones and triglycerides. So if it's referencing something that you like, we don't we don't talk about that right now you're more likely to kind of cross it out. And honestly, this one, Dr. Sarkar loves these kind of questions. Alcohol, the ones that he loves, they you'll ask, the um, um, alkane, alkene, <clears throat> alcohol. He loves these questions with these guys, the alkane, alkene, alcohol. Alcohol, he loves yeah. those kind of questions. So. He, I, and I've mentioned this several times in my videos, kind of this pass down, this step by step of how these all break down. So make sure you go back and 
and then whenever we talk and talk about those in the videos or in his lectures, you go back and, and review those and make sure you understand kind of the step by step of those. An oxidoreductase class of enzyme can be used for the conversion of there's the other acetaldehyde. He likes to ask about acetaldehyde. Yes, he does. For the conversion of, so let's see, carbon monoxide to water. Mm -hmm. So we have an oxidation reduction reaction, right? In an oxidation reduction reaction, what is occurring in an oxidation reduction reaction? What is being transferred? What do we focus on? The electrons. So electron transfer. Most often the electrons are transport transferred with what other atom? Usually with hydrogen. We're looking at that hydrogen. See so somebody's donating hydrogen. Somebody else is picking up somebody else is picking up a hydrogen. Okay. <clears throat> so if we look at these. A ketone to water. Have we really talked about ketones really up to this point? No. Not really. So more than likely, not going to be our answer. Carbon monoxide to water. Can we go by tr just transferring electrons? Can we go from carbon monoxide to water? Mm. I am fairly certain. I'm going to double check the answer just to be safe. OK, but yeah, not that. A and honestly, guys, nine times out of ten. Like if it has acetic acid, acetaldehyde, if it's you have, if, if you if you have no clue what the question is asking, guess these because he he loves these as answer choices. Oh, God, so yes, he does. like. <laughs> So like there's there's your tip of the day. Just guess those if you have absolutely no clue. Click the acetaldehyde or the alcohol or acetic acid, whatever. He really Click does that like and... them, I promise you that. Oh yeah. It's it's been since it's been almost three years since I took this class, and I still remember that. Ooh. And also on his exams, go with your gut instinct and don't go back and change your answers. <laughs> Unless you know for a fact what the After correct the answer fact is. After the fact yeah. Okay. So biosynthesis of ATP. So making of ATP. Let's think, are we, is it going to be endergonic? This word, dephosphorylation, methylation, exergonic. Um, let's go kind of go through these. What are we doing when we make ATP? Are we making bonds or breaking? Are we building stuff up or breaking stuff down? Building stuff up. Building stuff up. So immediately, what can we cross out? Exergonic reaction. Immediately cross out exergonic because we're building stuff. We're not releasing stuff and making energy. Uh, dephosphorylation. What does dephosphorylation mean? Breaking. Breaking down phosphates. Yep, you're breaking off phosphates. Again, that would also be an exergonic reaction. Mm -hmm. Meth methylation. Uh, does everybody know? Do you know what ATP stands for? What the chemical name of it is? Adenosine, Adenosine triphosphate. What this literally means, it's an adenosine molecule with three phosphates attached to it. You'll also see ADP which is adenosine diphosphate and AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate. OK. Every single time that we build and we add another bond, we're adding more potential chemical energy. So ATP has more potential energy than ADP and ADP has more potential energy than AMP. OK. In any point, adenosine triphosphate or diphosphate monophosphate, does any of those chemical formula names mention methyl or methyl group at all? Nope. Not at all. So what are we left with? Endergonic. An endergonic reaction. <laughs> nice. I'm also trying not to answer too many of these because I have the answers right in front of me. OK. 
Okay. Hide the answers in front of you then. I am. That's what I'm doing. I'm doing exactly okay. what you're doing. Sweet. Okay, so both immediately a little bit paragraphy, so I go to the bottom. The best explanation is that, okay, so we're looking to explain something away. Um, both water and glucose share an OH. What's an OH called? What's this functional group called? Hydroxyl. Hydroxyl, the most commonly seen with what? Alcohol. Perfect. So this hydroxyl can serve as a substrate for reaction with the terminal phosphate of ATP catalyzed by hexokinase. So the terminal phosphate, so the ending phosphate catalyzed hexokinase getting broken down. Okay. Glucose, however, is about a million times more reactive as a substrate than water. The blessed explanation is that more reactive as a substrate than water. The best explanation is that water normally will not reach the active site because it is hydrophobic. Glucose, glucose has more OH groups per molecule than does water. The larger glucose binds better to the enzyme and induces conformational change in hexokinase that produces blah, 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 blah. Water in the second substrate ATP can be for the aggregate, resulting in a competitive inhibition of the enzyme. This is one of those questions. When I see really long answer choices, it makes my brain hurt. To be completely honest, this is one that I would kind of be like, oh, I'm going to go with this. And if I and move on, and if I have time at the end, come back to it and actually like fully read through it. Try not to do that with every question, but every now and then, like if you need like a quick, like the, the goal is to get to the end of the exam. You don't want to lose out. <clears throat> you don't want to miss out on answering questions because those are potentially, those are immediately lost, immediate lost points if you don't finish answering questions. Another thing you can do if you're not sure about it on the top, it always says question completion. Skip yeah. it and you can go check it at the end to make sure you have filled everybody in. If you're not sure on somebody. Yeah. Okay, so then read it. Both one and glucose share an OH. If we don't understand what's going on, both one and glucose come back and reread the question. If you don't understand what's going on, come back and reread the question. Both water and glucose share an OH that can serve as substrate for action with the terminal phosphate of ACP. Okay. Glucose is way more reactive than water. Best explanation is. Honestly, I couldn't tell you what the answer is right away. My immediate thought. I'm thinking C or D. A is definitely not right, though. Yeah. I don't know. Larger glucose binds to the enzyme. It induces confirmation change. Hexokinase it brings active site amino acids into position for cat, cat, catalysis. Catalysis. I hate these words. I can never say them. Catalysis. Um, yeah, and that's where it kind of goes. This is also kind of stupid, but like a majority of the time, the longer answers are also correct. So if you're going I've to also, guess, yeah. guess, guess the longer answer. If you have no clue, guess one of the longer answers. I don't know why teachers do that, but... That's often the case. Honestly, this question, like I said, this would be one that I would probably skip and just take the L on, or I just click a random answer. I'd guess between C and D and move on with my life and be like, eh, it is what it is. 50, 50 shot that I'll, that I'll get it right. And, and not spend three minutes trying to figure this out. Yep. Right. Ender, we should be able to answer this question relatively easy. Endergonic reactions are in equilibrium. None of the above is true. Has negative delta G, has positive delta G values. What are endergonic reactions? D. Mm -hmm. As positive. What if I change this to... spontaneous reactions, what would the answer be? C. Equilibrium. C would be C, because the negative delta G are spontaneous. If I said non-spontaneous reactions. Negative. Non-spontaneous has positive delta G values. Spontaneous is negative. Remember, spontaneous. 
Okay. Non spontaneous. Um, if I was like an AKA too, because endergonic, exergonic. Yep. Exactly. If I said a heat releasing reaction or energy releasing reaction, what would my answer be? C. 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 If I said energy absorbing what would it be D. exactly good all of these are just different kind of aka ways that he, they can ask the exact same question all right endergonic reactions drives the reaction in a forward direction on equilibrium absorbs heat energy drives a reaction in a backward direction C. D. Answer is C. Wait. That's a bad question. Because it does it does do C. It absorbs heat energy. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand. Why would it drive it in a, a backwards direction because bonds are still made i mean would be i'd feel like that's driving it forward if it's making bonds um so think about the endergonic because they're non-spontaneous right so if we look back at our charts i, I can see with the answer but honestly that's a bad question because technically it is c um Uh, so right here like this with reactants and with products being at a lower energy right here this right here is this an exergonic or an endergonic reaction right here that is this is graph is showing the endergonic because it's creating right so so reactants and products it doesn't tell us we could have one reactant and we could have 10 products over here it just doesn't it doesn't tell us how many of each that we have so we don't know if this is creating bonds or breaking bonds based on that look at the amount of energy so we start with more energy in the reactants and then energy is released during the reaction so we start oh, higher okay. and we go lower so if energy is released away outside of the products is that exergonic or endergonic exergonic yeah can you can you move the screen over okay I can't. It Google won't let me do that. Because <laughs> yeah, the way the way Google set up. Um, and if we find this guy here, in this right here, our reactants are lower than our products right here, and so we're having to absorb energy. Right? Is this exergonic or endergonic? Should be endergonic. This is endergonic. So it's more difficult to go forward than it is to go back because it's harder to put stuff together and build stuff than it is to go just slide right back down. So it's kind of like imagine like this is a hill. So it's way harder to push a boulder all the way up this hill to get to here than it is to push a boulder this way. And then all of a sudden it just drops off and falls this way. So it's easier for endergonic reactions to go backwards. So from, from, go from saying that, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What were you saying? You're saying that graph there depicts which top? An endergonic or an endothermic. E N D E R. Endergonic. So the one that absorbs energy or creates bonds and is non-spontaneous. This, this is why like words are super, super important, because a lot of these words sound incredibly similar. And if you're reading questions quickly, you can very easily say the wrong thing in your in your head when you're reading it. So it's just very, very careful. Like words like this, you need to make sure you slow down and make sure that they're they're completely sorted in your brain 
that you know for a fact what is what they mean and like what definition wise what they are. Okay. So I have a question about 13. Yeah, um, go ahead. I was reading or not reading. I was watching your YouTube video for chapter four and for Endergonic, you like wrote out that it like feels cold. So I don't understand why it would absorb heat energy if it feels cold. Um, so it's kind of like if you put ice in your hand, what's what's happening? It's like the eye, if you put ice in your hand, it feels cold because it's sucking the heat away. When I, you put ice in your hand, your hand feels cold and the ice starts to melt because it's pulling away the energy from your hand, absorbing it into itself. And that's why. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. OK, I don't love that. I do not like this question at all. Personally, I think this is another thing. If you guys, um, after each test, go and meet with the doctor. So this is a question that I genuinely feel like if you can explain to the professor the whole endergonic, so an endergonic reaction, like takes in energy, all that is cold and the around it, all that sort of. If you can explain that, if you put this as an answer, I guarantee, as long as you can explain this clearly, you would get points back on that. And that's the benefit of going to meet with the professors after each exam, is you can. And Dr. Sarkar does give you the opportunity to meet with him, meet one on one after exams. Yeah. So if you are not happy with your grade, or like you're like close, especially at the beginning, the first test, if you can go and you can like meet with him and figure out like what kind of what the roadblocks are, what's go going going wrong. Super super helpful, and off, I think every single time I've met with a professor. I've gotten at minimum like four points back minimum as long as you can explain why you put answer choices and help them to see like hey this is a valuable answer choice because of x y and z or if you explain like this is why I think it's a valuable answer choice because of x y and z and they tell you no it's not because and then then they can give you an explanation that should clear up any confusion if you were thinking something incorrectly which is also a very very big help Ah, um, this we've already talked about. So enzymes accelerate the rate of chemical reaction by doing what to the free energy of activation reaction or the activation energy lowers the activation energy. Enzymes differ from other catalysts in that only enzymes display specificity toward a single reactant are not consumed in the reaction, form an activated complex with the reactants, fail to influence the equilibrium point of the reaction. I promise you this question or some format of it is on the test. I guarantee it. Guaranteed. Yep. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that one actually before. Okay. So what do we think? Not Christine. What, is it Christine or Christine? Christine. Christine. Okay. Hey, all if I butcher your names, please correct me. <laughs> I'm used to be calling um, this, so don't worry about it. Okay. Is it C? What'd you say, Michelle? I said C, but I could why? be wrong. <laughs> yeah, I think it's why, C. That's why. why. Why do we think? Why do we think C? I mean, Let's that's what it does. Me. It forms a complex. <laughs> so when we think of, I'm going to tell you. Right, I'm. I am fairly certain our answer is going to be B. Again, I think this is a sucky question. Because Ooh, enzymes do the do on this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to shut up. I would put B every single day. Because enzymes are never fully consumed unless yeah. they're just completely broken. Yeah, then the enzymes enzymes should always be left. They should never be consumed. Once a reaction occurs, they should not be consumed. Um. This is a question I could see him asking this kind of question and being like having this one like one two of the above are correct 
And okay. I would say I would say like A and B are correct. Um, so the activated complex with the actin, so they don't form, they, they do form a complex to kind of create and to like move forward, but they're not going to um, remain part of that. Again, I don't love this question. Big idea that I would say two things that we sure, sure need to know. His test questions, I remember, are are a little bit better than this. Um, there's yeah, I don't like I do not like this question at all. But the um, two things we need to remember about enzyme. Two things to remember about enzymes. One. One enzyme to one reactant. So each each enzyme only is going to respond to one reactant. It's not going to do its job for anything else. So they are very, very specific and they are not consumed in the reaction. Both of these things are the case. I think I generally think this is just a crappy question. And again, if it's a crappy question and you can go in and you can explain to him exactly why you think it's a crappy question, not that it's a crappy question why you think that there might be multiple correct answers. That's a better way of saying that. You can get points back and you'll vote and you'll learn something. And also if you can explain and show your thinking, there's a lot of times, even if like you got the incorrect answer and like, <clears throat> but you demonstrate your thinking through it. A lot of times even just ask like, can I get half credit on it? And a lot of times like teachers will give you half credit. I don't Dr. think I've ever seen Sarkar give half credit for anything. Dr. Sarkar might not, but other teachers might. So, I right, exergonic reactions uh, drives the reaction backward direction, drive the reaction to forward direction, absorbs heat energy, are in equilibrium. We should, we saw this one. Yeah, it yep. should go in a forward direction because exergonic reactions, remember, are they spontaneous or non spontaneous? They're spontaneous. Yeah. Exergonic reactions again have negative delta G, has positive delta G, or are in equilibrium, or none of the above is true. Let's see if they have the positive delta G values. Nope, Ender. I see. I didn't make the mistake. I'm tired, and I and I read Ender instead of Exer. It has negative. So there's there's another tip, y'all. Don't if you your tests are um synchronous, right? They're like in the they're in the mornings. You have to take them in the mornings. Asynchronous. They're yeah, asynchronous from six a.m. to eleven fifty nine p.m. What? I right, do not wait until nine forty four p.m. to take y'all's exam because yeah, my brain is exhausted right now. <laughs> like all oh, good. <laughs> Re trying to read the stuff at this time, especially if you just crammed the whole day, like you're going to be tired and you're going to make stupid mistakes just like I just did. The glycolytic pathway. Why does he have this question in here? Does he cover this in this chapter? That's it talks stupid. about it. That's later on. It's exergonic. Yup. I mean, it kind of gives it away in the word. I hope he asked lots of simple questions like this. Yeah, glycolytic. Yeah, fair chance that one doesn't happen that often. Yeah. Well, you'll yeah. you'll have you'll have a good. It's about fifty fifty. Like you're gonna have half your questions be a little bit longer, and half your questions be like super straightforward. Like you just have to figure out like getting the rhythm down of answering, answer the short ones quicker, and answer the long ones. Make sure you like we talked about skipped skip to the end of the end of the question, figure out what it's asking and then get through it. I know you're tired. If you can explain Michaela's Michaela's Menton constant crap, I'll be extremely happy. Uh, I can. <laughs> you I'm, don't I'm, have to. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling because he's asking me about it tomorrow morning and I still don't get it. I'm like 90% sure. Even if you go back to my like um, cause he does ask a lot about this stuff. If you go to like my YouTube videos, I literally say like, y'all, I don't know how to do this crap. <laughs> um, let me find not you board exams, part one boards, biochem. 
I'll be honest. There is a really good. There are really good. Um, Ninja Nerd does gr- a great video. Does great videos on this equation. Okay. Um. So does Khan Academy. They have a really couple of really really good ones. Um. Come on, word. Respond. I can show y'all is the way that I just got through. Me. Come on. My computer's having a seizure. There we go. Maybe. There we go. Uh, Here we go. All of this stuff, this whole VMAX, VKM, all this sort of stuff. Um, I'm going to look at the actual Michaelis equation. I think we'll do this and then I'll prob- we'll probably call it a night because I, th- I don't know if my brain can handle much more. <laughs> Michaelis, constant. I have one question off topic and I'm going to or I'm going to forget to ask it. Um, Go for it. I have to use that. Oh, gosh, I don't even know what it's called. Hassle back, whatever. Do we ever have to calculate pH? No, you need to understand like what the qu- equation represents. Uh, OK. And like kind of what. Um, he'll ask you like questions about the equation of like, what does it mean if this value is equal to this value? It's like, oh, it's because like, more, it means more. like the, the P yeah. It's like, it means Negative that this positive. is, this is the pH. Yeah. Stuff okay. like that. All right, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> so this equation, the Michaelis constant equation, what it tells us is how quickly a reaction is occurring. So if we have a container of liquid with a bunch of an enzyme mixed into it, and then we squirt in the reactant, how quickly is that reaction going to occur? Okay. How quickly the reaction occurs is our Vmax, the Km, is the substrate concentration at one half of Vmax. So we have our maximum velocity, we divide it by two, um, and we find our Km value. Our S is our substrate concentration, how much, how much of our substrate is mixed into the stuff. And that gives us our initial velocity of how fast everything moves. You don't need to know all the specifics of this equation. <laughs> Just like what we're about to look at comes from this equation. Okay. Okay. So this specific question, how is the Michaelis constant, how Michaelis constant is related to the reaction velocity in a typical standard enzymatic reaction? So the answer is so Km is the substrate concentration at half maximal reaction velocity. I'm pretty sure he asks almost this exact question. Something like this, where what we just saw here, kind of what this is, that's the answer for this. If he asks a question about the constant, about like Michaelis constant specifically, this is the way he's going to ask that question. Other ways he can ask questions about this is he'll give it to you in parts of like, for example, what happens if you introduce a competitive inhibitor or a non-competitive inhibitor into the solution at the same time, okay? Um, and this is honestly, this is literally just how I, I just memorized this little piece of these pieces right here. 
And this is what got me through enough of the questions to not have to worry too much about this. If you want to actually understand this, hey, go Dre, watch. Hey, I hate to interrupt, but are you sharing your screen? Because I don't know what you're oh, looking at. I am not. My bad. My bad. Let's go back. Here's what I was showing before. The initial velocity, the substrate concentration, um, max velocity, and our KM is the substrate concentration at half of Vmax. Okay. <clears throat> Honestly, this kind of stuff, anytime you get equations, if he potentially will ask you questions like about the equation itself, this is how I write out equations to understand what each component is and like what it's about. Okay. So do stuff like this with equations. This right here, this stuff is mostly what he'll ask questions about. How if you add different things, how stuff will change. <clears throat> so. The value, so the KM value, so we say KM equals half of V max. KM is essentially meaning the amount of substrate that's required to reach one half of the maximum velocity. So the maximum velocity being how quickly the amount of enzyme that you have can react with all of the substrate or all of the reactant, okay? And that's this chart, this little graph right here. If we add inhibitors, so if we add a competitive inhibitors, we increase the KM value, which increasing the KM value means that we decrease the affinity for the enzyme. So if we think about this logically, if we throw in a competitive inhibitor, it's going to take up some of the active sites of the enzymes and not allow as much stuff to bind right away. So we decrease our overall affinity. But we will have no change in Vmax. This is just straight memorization. Again, like you you can go and and learn and figure this all out. I personally never did because again, it was way over my brain, way over my head. Like and this uh, amount of time that it takes, he he'll ask a handful of questions like this but it wasn't worth like the three or four hours of my life to go like l actually learn all of this stuff. Okay. Our non-competitive inhibitors, if we increase, if we add them, we have no change in our KM. So there's no change in the affinity, but we get a decreased V max because they're going to bind to the allosteric site and change the enzyme conformation. Okay, like I said, this is just straight kind of memorize these, like what happens, like if KM goes up, affinity goes down, Vmax doesn't change. If um, you add non-competitive inhibitors, the KM doesn't change, but Vmax decreases. This is literally like how he'll ask these questions. Or like he'll say, if you decrease the KM value, what happens to affinity? And affinity would go up. So it's just like, uh, just those are the kind of general questions he'll ask about that. Um, trying to go much deeper than that. Like I said, for me, I didn't feel like it was super worth it to be able to just answer those couple of questions. Again, if you want to go in there, um, Khan Academy or Ninja Nerd, We'll have, see, Ninja Nerd will have uh, my callus Menton equation, and he'll go through. I actually did watch this video at some point, and it was really, really good. And he'll like walk you through how you get to each of the different equations. And he'll like, he even has videos like on enzyme inhibition, all sort of stuff. Um, other people have a lot of these videos. Again, take it with a grain of salt. Like, if you have the, hour or two to go through all of this stuff to really understand this great if not know this level and get through the exam and call it a day so 
in any other questions about that? Hopefully that's 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 the best advice I can give you guys. Thank you for explaining it because it actually makes sense now. Okay. I'm glad. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and stop there. Um, thank you guys for being here. Um, I'll, you know, I'll post this and everything. If y'all have any questions or stuff that pop up, feel free to send me a message. I probably when is y'all's test? Y'all's test is Monday. Monday. On Monday. Okay, so I won't see you guys before then. On uh, on the YouTube channel, I have a full like four part series breakdown of like going through the entire um, for exam one review sheet. As well, if you can find somebody who is willing to, let me make sure you stop. Yeah, if you can find somebody who's willing to like share these questions, that kind of stuff. Christine, if you have them and are willing to share them, great. Um, if you do do more of these and you could send them to me, I'm. I will. I'll see if I can if I have time <clears throat> to sit down and like I can go through all of these like in a YouTube video and like walk through and explain them. Uh, I can, I'll try and do that. I can um, do five. I'll do like five through, I think five through nine is our next one, isn't it? Our next unit? I, I think so. I'll send over five yeah. through nine. Once I get through my exam on Monday, I'll send them over because I'm not planning on doing anything else related to biochemistry yeah. for at least a day. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll I'll see if I can get through some of this stuff um, and kind of a answer, like make a video recording myself answering these and like kind of explaining through them. Yeah, this one was um, a long one. I think that's the second longest of the. Did my login work for you, by the way? I no, I didn't try it at all. I've been, I've been sleepy. Let me know if it works for you because I know one of the girls in our class. I let her borrow it just to try to do some of them, and it worked for her. So okay, sweet. Um, yeah, honestly, sending it out in this format because you can not not answer the questions and still submit it, and like this this format works great. All right, guys, um, if you're going to have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I'll see if I can. I'll post some of the stuff. If, what if I do post it? I'll, I'll let you all know um, when I do. But start studying now. And I wish you all the best on y'all's exams. Thank you, Thank Drake. You, Drake. Have a good night, everybody. Good night.